Let's get into it. One, two, three. Hello and welcome to my whiskey fan, your favorite public access whiskey review show where craft whiskey is king. And that is 110% right today because we have Jason Fruits with us from Old 55 Distillery in Indiana. This is some unique stuff you heard us do the review a couple weeks ago. And it also did win Mike's Craft Bourbon of the Year just last year. So we're all big fans. But before we go any further, Mike, what do we usually tell everyone in the chat or who's watching later to do? Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, share, hit that bell notification, comment in the chat if you're watching live, comment down below if you watch us later on, and don't forget to check us out. Pretty much every Monday night is a live episode in our Evening With series. Yes, yes. So thank you everyone for stopping in. Everyone in the chat, what are you guys drinking? And what is everyone on the show here drinking? I'm obviously assuming we're drinking Old 55. So I'm starting out with uh, Bottled in Bond, uh, Bottle 20 of Batch 16CA2 is where I'm starting off. So I still have I still have a little bit left of each that I might need to save. <laughs> Mike, Ben, what are you guys having? I'm a- I'm having the a single barrel pick of old 55 that was done by the ABV network. It was the, oh. uh, the evil Knievel birthday pick. <gasps> Very cool. <laughs> Son, I'm sorry. That's evil Knievel just got me for a second. Sorry. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm, I'm on the same as you, Patty. Uh, I got okay. that, uh, that bottled and bond. Mm-hmm. Going right and, now. and Jason, I'm, what are you sipping on this evening? Well, I told you guys that right before we got on, it was a disaster. So I brought out the big dog. So um, uh, the uh, I have yet to I tasted it when we bottled it, but this is uh, this year's holiday release of our sweet corn at Castring. So this is actually over four years. It's a fifty-eight point nine, so it's a um, hundred and seventeen point eight proof sweet corn. It is, um, yeah, it's pretty cool stuff, man. Yeah. I've literally well, this will probably be the only time in twenty twenty one that I drink. Sweet corn, no joke. That's that's just it's so. I don't. It, it's so. It's such a pain in my ass. I'll be totally honest. <laughs> I, I don't. I don't drink, and I crack special occasions only. And like I said, well, we won't get into the disaster earlier, but uh, it's all good. Everything's good. But this is uh, here we go. This one's for my wife, actually. So <laughs> cheers to her. Cheers. <laughs> yes. Cheers. And uh, and that's uh, what you were talking about. We'll get into, but that's. Uh, the mash and the type you're talking about there, uh, sweet corn is pretty interesting. That I, and I was gonna say, I've heard really good things about it, I just haven't got to try that one yet. Um, but for everyone who doesn't know, like I was saying, you guys are, are from Indiana now, you're the co founder. Now, what made you want to become a distiller or kind of walk down the path to opening a distillery? Absolutely, it is, uh, um, a it, the most random path you've ever heard in your life. So uh, um, I come from a super conservative family. Uh, we are still conservative to this day. And when I say conservative, um, the only whiskey that was in my family growing up is my grandma would have like a half gallon of some trash. I mean, now I call it trash. <laughs> in the back of her closet that was for, uh, and it was, uh, I mean, gosh, this was probably a half gallon from the 60s. And I'm talking of the 90s when I would have a sore throat and my mom, my grandma would bring it over and make whiskey, honey, and lemon juice. You know what I mean? In the microwave and a teacup. And that is, that is the whiskey that we have. So uh, my mom might have six margaritas a year, you know, that's kind of her. And my dad uh, has never drank. He, he's never had a sip of beer or liquor in his life. And uh, so that we own a distillery now is uh, just cracks me up to no end. Like I, it's uh, (laughs) a, pretty funny but uh how this all started is uh is family man um if there's there's anything i can um iterate tonight is that uh this brand and this distillery is legacy it is all about um i always say this i am a product i'm nothing but a product of um uh good breeding and better raising man i'm i get to call two sets of grandparents and my parents just like 
and I, guys, I'm sorry, I have a terrible potty mouth, so I will, I will PC myself. But no, 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 you, you no, just crossed no. the five minute line. Yeah, you, you, you can say yeah, whatever you want. You hit the perfect oh, nice. mark. Okay. So <laughs> I, I always say this. I, man, I am a product of uh, some of the most badass Americans I've ever met in my life. I just get to call them grandma, grandpa, mom, and dad, and they are. Uh, they're awesome. So, uh, 1968, my grandfather, uh, bought a grain elevator, grain elevator in Newtown, Indiana. Um, everybody told him he was absolutely crazy. Um, we are, uh, we are absolutely the all American. I mean, we are the American story. You know what I mean? Uh, we come from nothing. Uh, so my grandpa passed away two years ago, uh, Navy vet, like just, you know, just an awesome dude, man. Uh, my other grandpa was a Carpenter built most of the houses around Fountain County in the area, like just soup, like salt of the earth, worked with his hands every day. Uh, I, I'll tell you a story. I, I remember roofing my first house with him when I was like a eighth grader freshman in high school. And my, my family's all swimmers. My brother was a 14 time division one all American swimmer. Like, and I, I mean, I, we, we were all, you know, swimming studs. And I remember watching my grandpa and he would have been gosh, like 61 at the time or something. And he goes up this ladder with four shingles, uh, four packs of shingles on each shoulder. Yeah. Uh, two, two, yeah. four total. Um, and goes up and, and I'm 15 and like a hoss, you know, I mean, I bench pressed 250 probably. And I couldn't get one up that ladder without almost peeing my pants. You know, I mean, I was like, this guy is a superhero, you know, like what the heck. And, uh, this is, uh, this is the stock we come from. So, uh, pretty cool. So, um, but to that, um, you know, I, uh, my parents get all the credit, man. They, uh, if you would have told me in my late teens, early twenties that I'd be back in Newtown, I'd punch in the mouth, man. I wanted to get out of there as fast as possible. And, uh, Newtown is tiny. I mean, it's like, I think the last census was like, uh, uh, they're going to release the new one. I think we're going to basically barely break a hundred, you know, it's a hundred people. There's no, there's some stop signs. That's it. We have a five-way stop in the middle of town. It's tiny. Um, yes, because he that, considered incorporated or not? Oh uh, no, no, no. Okay, no. okay. So, yeah. So uh, I always jokingly say we're like, uh, you know, we're northwest, uh, northeast Fountain County's uh, Richland Township, which is where the school is, the old Richland Township School, which yeah. is where the distillery is. We're like the friendliest tax-paying mafia, is what I say. My dad owns <laughs> all the all the businesses. He's on the merit board for the sheriff's department. Like we just, my dad, man, he is he's the best. So, uh, circa 2008 or so, my dad had been bugging me. So I'd been I'm a Purdue graduate. I had, I had graduated four years before that. Right after I graduated, I uh, I worked for dad for a summer because he asked me to. And if dad asks you to do anything, which he never does, you just stop whatever you're doing and do it because yeah. he's the best. And, uh, um, that spending about six months at home with my mom was enough to make me want to run for the Hills. So, and my mom is the greatest. She's just 200% mom. You know how it is. You get out of four years of freedom and you're like, what are you kidding me? So, um, helped at the grain elevator. Um, my dad hates it when I say this, we are, we are one of the largest family owned grain operations left in the country because there are no family owned grain operations left They're They're, they're just, they don't exist. We're, yep. we are a complete anomaly. And, uh, um, so, and that is because of my dad and my grandpa and, and just, I, I can't sing their praises enough. So my dad wanted to diversify. And once again, I'm like, pops, I would help you do anything, but I have no interest in coming back to Newtown to do anything. Like you're crazy. I'm, I'm out. And, um, uh, I have decided that he is an evil genius because he literally has all of us back in Newtown. My, my sister is making the segue back it is uh it's pretty incredible and i wouldn't and and the way he's done it is the best way you could possibly do it it's it's legacy man he we've all been out to the world we've seen it, it it's a pretty cool big world and, and we love that world but we uh i think the four of us want to make our stamp on the world and be able to uh uh provide the you know the same things that my grandparents and my parents worked they're ever, and are still working their ever loving butts off to provide me. Uh, and we want to do that. I want to do that for my nieces and nephews and, you know, I mean, and all those, and that's, that's what this brand is about as family, man. It's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. That's great. So we, uh, yeah, like two, 2010 ish, it was kind of more about uh, me and my little brother getting dad out of work. Cause my dad just is a workaholic and he's awesome. And, uh, um, we just traveled around to a bunch of craft distillers and, um, uh, you know, like I said, this is still a pipe dream. I didn't, we don't come from money. I, uh, 
I just never thought it was to be possible. My dad told me to bring him a business plan in about 2011. I brought him a business plan. And he goes, yep, this looks good. Let's do it. And that's when, uh, you know, I, I, I'll, I'll once again apologize for being crass, but I think my butt finally unclenched about a year and a half ago. You know, I mean, maybe two years ago from that conversation. So, um, you know, I always tell people all the time when, uh, you know, and I've been told this because we, you know, uh, we've just, we, we have people interested in us and they always say, man, you must just be like the ballsiest guy in the world. And I tell them all the time, <clears throat> when you borrow that kind of money from the man that you love and respect most on the planet, like failure is not an option, man. Uh, mm -hmm. We, uh, I used to, I always call myself, you'll hear me say this. I'm just the world's biggest spoiled asshole. I used to say spoiled brat, but nobody wants to work the hours that I work. So uh, <laughs> we, or we all, in all disciplines, we all, we all work too much and too hard, but it's for something, which makes it, you know, a lot of days, man, I, don't get me wrong. There are days that it feels like work, but uh mo the vast majority it's not work when you know you're building something that means something you know what i mean so yep. yeah you were mentioning your grain a minute oh, hold, hold on a second there the thing jumped uh grain um uh mitch is wondering what are your thoughts on big grain companies eg um or consolidated grain i mean it's it's what you got to do i mean there'd be an argument to be totally honest with with the size that we are the amount of bushels we we handle millions and millions of bushels uh, there's an argument that I'm consolidated grain. Does that make sense? Like, even though I'm a, you know, I'm not the biggest distiller in the world. I mean, we handle enough grain. I mean, I always joke if we, if we, if I distilled all the grain that my family handled, I would be as big as every distillery in Kentucky put together. You know what I mean? Like that's, that's how much grain we handle. So, um, and we'd be having this, uh, we'd be having this, uh, um, interview on my private island you know what i mean <laughs> yeah, so, um, uh, if you knew my family that would be laughable because we were about the most you know laid back you know non uh what i want to say you know i mean we we just it, it's it, it, we, we are about the most salt of the earth basic people you can get to you know so mm -hmm. we, we appreciate few things so i always joke the family motto is is usually uh, do everything the hardest way possible and then throw the most power equipment in it until one of the boys almost dies and then dad just laughs at us. You know, that's pretty much how we do it. <laughs> that's how we do it. So, so without any, any family distilling history and no, no whiskey consumption to speak of, I mean, how, how did you start distilling? Well, let's, uh, let, let's, okay. So um, I don't know how much you guys know about Purdue University, but you pretty much get like a PhD in beer drinking while you're there. So it's an engineering ag school and there's, and this is not, this is unfair now. Uh, but the joke is, you know, there's like seven girls on campus and so there's like 30,000 students and it's like seven girls and they're in the ag school and like, and no offense to the ag girls. Like it's totally different now. They have tons of girls there, but they were, you know, or 2000 to 2004, I was there. I got to go to, you know, the Rose Bowl with Drew Brees, pretty cool. Um, uh, there's just, you know, like, and, and it's one of the toughest schools on the planet, man. And they just, you know, I mean, it's, it's, they butcher you. And, uh, um, I, I always laughed that I, I, I appreciated beer there. I actually uh, worked in the casino industry and that got me my, uh, love of bourbon actually. Cause I couldn't hold, I couldn't hold a beer and pretend to drink it all day, but I could bourbon. So that's where I learned a lot. So <laughs> when you say no one drinking, I, to, to the uh, fear of my parents, I drank plenty of whiskey and beer in college. Don't worry. Like I, uh, more than my fair share. There are the famous pictures of, 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 uh, all of my buddies on it. We, well, we call it the Purdue excrement, but it's the Purdue exponent is the name of the paper. And, uh, we are, it's famous. We are on the front of it. And it's, it's a, it's an article on over drinking on campus. And it's literally me and my, my five buddies. From college. And, uh, so we have, a, we have this great tradition called breakfast club. So the bars open at 6 AM and you basically drink and you go in costume. So I had this beautiful SpongeBob outfit. Uh, my buddy was a nun and we're all walking in costume across to go to um, uh, Ross Aid Stadium, which is our football stadium. And, you know, I mean, it's we've been drinking since 6 a.m. and it's like 1230. Like you can imagine the disaster that this is. And, yeah, it's, it's fantastic. My, uh, my parents have it matted. They're like so proud of him, I think, you know, so, yeah, pretty funny, pretty funny. So so how how that uh, transition was, we always had this joke that um you know we have all this corn we should make uh we should make some uh make some whiskey right and and i had i always said this i'm kind of an idiot savant so i have three degrees from purdue my master's of business and uh school's pretty easy um so the science of distillation is easy 
Um, and I always, I always love to say this, like I didn't, you know, we came into, I came into distilling and old 55 from a business standpoint. Like I wanted to create something uh, and I fell in love with distilling because of the nerdery of it. You know what I mean? And all like the devil being in the details and all this expression that you can do and the yeast and this and that, and like, Oh man, like this is, you know, this is right up my alley. This is what I'm talking about. And th that's how I fell into, and, and so we, uh, how that journey started is like I said, dad said yes to this. And, uh, so I, uh, like I said, uh, in a mild panic attack was like, well, I have no idea And my dad, he's the smartest businessman on the planet, but he, you know, he knew he had been at all the craft distillers. He knew roughly what we were getting ourselves into, you know, but I was like, Hey, I've crunched these numbers. I don't, I don't really believe in him. We need a, we need a consultant. So we hired a consultant, um, uh, uh, Dave Pickerel. We, we, you know, we, we spoke with him, uh, he, you know, has passed away a year and a half ago. And, um, we, we just kind of, we were just trying to get all of our ducks in a row before we actually spent any money. Does that make sense? And, and to totally see if this not. was even, if it was just a pipe dream. Uh, and I was of course ridiculously concerned cause I wasn't going to spend a penny of, of my dad's money that I, well, I was joked like I, spent my inheritance 10 times over and I never even knew I had an inheritance, you know, I mean, like, what, what is this, you know, so we, uh, we, uh, we definitely did. And I'm, like I said, more idiot than Savant, but that's my personality, man. I'm, uh, I'm, uh, upset. You get me on a topic, I get obsessive and I can do, I just love to dig deep into it and figure it out. And, mm -hmm. uh, so I did, you know, I read every book there was, we hired a consultant, we did all that. I kind of knew, um, I will, I always say this in the tasting room, but, uh, you know, the best thing about owning a distillery with your dad who doesn't drink is you get to make everything you like. So, um, you guys are, you guys are all drinking my weeded bourbon, which is my favorite thing I make. You know what I mean? Like I like weeded, I like weeders. This is, mm -hmm. that's my weeder. You know what I mean? We did sweet corn that was weird. And then we've kind of branched out and done a couple other cool, you know, American whiskey since then a single malt that just won, uh, best American single malt at the international whiskey competition. Like, it's just been it's been fun and that's a scotch-esque product so it's obviously not scotch uh mm -hmm. but it's a single malt that is a scotch that i would like that's literally what you know what i mean i'm like yeah this is you know this <laughs> if i was gonna make one this is what i would do and then you know I, I it's been fun because over the last two years we've you know won about every award we possibly could and people keep agreeing with me so i don't know i guess i'm on to something i don't know well, you got to make something you like. I, I, I always yeah. find that funny that some distillers are like, well, I, I don't like all these things, but I make them like, well, what if you get stuck with it at the end or some shit goes yeah. wrong? It's like, don't, don't you at least want to be stocked up for life or something? Yeah. Well, so we don't make a rye currently mm -hmm. uh, because um, I actually do like rye whiskey. I don't think there's anything wrong. But one thing I would say is I think rye is a way for – a lot of distillers to make a crappy whiskey and they blame all that heat and and spice you know which rye is not spicy it is sharp like a, there's a whole argument that i will go down that you know this is a rabbit hole but most rye whiskeys to me are just poorly made and it's overdone i'm like so there's a perfect example like i i think rye and we will do a rye someday i it'll happen um i just i it's just not a segment that i'm not like wanting to do a cannonball into for that exact yeah, reason i'm like yeah. no i got you know there's a lot of bourbon i'd like to make before i worry about a rye you know what i mean so that's kind of where i'm at so we, that, that was one of the questions i was going to ask you because you're you you stayed you know grain to bottle you know with, with your product for the for the most part correct i mean it's pretty uh, so much we, all or your grain so we grow all this on my grandpa's farm except for one product um which is actually the weirdest whiskey that we make in it and also the closest thing to a rye that we make so we have a product called wabash cannonball which is um kind of an ode to uh fountain county uh purdue so the wabash cannonball is a song made famous by johnny mm -hmm. cash but it actually predated him by i don't know 30 years it's an old folk song mm -hmm. it's a great song google it listen to it it's fantastic um but the train came through attica which is about 10 minutes from Newtown and it was a it was a direct ride from Detroit to St. Louis and of course like the the Purdue uh the Boilermaker special is a train like it, it's like all things childhood does that make sense like this mm -hmm. that's what this thing re <laughs> yeah. it represents and uh the sweet corn was weird and I was like man I want to make something else weird so it is a millet sorghum whiskey it's like 50 50 oh. I would say uh if you um if you if if rye and corn had a baby, it would taste like sorghum. So it is, um, 
it's sweet, but it's got that sharpness, that that spice that a lot of people associate with with rye. And and here's the funniest thing, like um, the way I explain it to people, and and everybody says this is dead on. Because um, actually, when we take here's a perfect example, of me. Um, I actually, and this not, this is not completely true because that product sells out within two days of us ever bringing it out of the barrel. It's like we'll bring up six barrels, you know, and it'll be like seven hundred some bottles, and it's gone on a Saturday. And I'm like, what? How is this? But people love it. It's cheaper. It's it, it's a non-estate product to uh, prove. Uh, to show uh, it's a teaching tool exactly to what you just asked me. So we grow everything. It's all literally a state um, product. So um, uh, all comes from, so I always like to say, if you take a sip, like all those, everything you guys are sipping, uh, that came from one field that's in my grandpa's trust that went to my my family's at Grain Elevator that my dad owns, that me and my siblings will own someday, uh, distilled by me at the distillery that my siblings and my dad and I own um, from one barrel. So we single barrel every product. It's about there. You literally couldn't be any more transparent than, uh, than, than what this is. I mean, we've, we've even uh, talked about doing like a QR code on the outside mm-hmm. and dropping. The only reason is uh, security. Like we, I don't, cause the sweet corn's out there and, uh, and showing like we, we haven't been able to figure out how to make, the Google Maps anonymous, but like it basically would drop, so you can be like, "Oh, boop! This is the field it came from." Yeah. You know what I mean? Like we can show you yeah. exactly. Like we know that it's we have to track that at the grain elevator anyway. So um, it's it's pretty cool, you know. That's so. Um, the the millet sorghum. The millet comes from North Dakota, and the sorghum comes from Missouri. And we know the farms those okay. come from. Um, okay. I actually wanted to grow that. I didn't. I didn't ever when we started. I didn't ever want to make a non-state product, but uh, I needed a teaching tool. I needed to show it to people uh, like, hey, we can make whiskey like everybody else, which is actually laughable. Like, you know, like mm-hmm. nobody really does what we do. But um, we like but to that point, I was like, listen, I can just buy grain. And here's the funny thing. Like when we you know, there's plenty of awesome like grain to glass uh, distillers. And, and every time I make Wabash Cannonball, I me and my siblings and I both think to ourselves, why in the hell do we do a state? Because it's like. You know, anytime I need grain, it's, of course, at the worst possible time at the elevator, and we have to move an auger, or, you know, I mean, they're dumping trucks, and then the brothers and I are cussing at each other, and I'm like, I need this now, and, like, that shows up on, like, a whatever carrier, you know, FedEx shows up with a semi, I pull it off on super totes, I distill it, I put it away, uh, there's no barrel cost, because I've already, I'm using my once-used bourbon barrels to age that in, and I'm like, that was like so this is what everybody else does that's that's absolutely freaking awesome why why do we do this why do we go but that's uh the reason we do it is we want to show off like what uh what we can do what my family does and i think it's uh you know like i said it's kind of owed to them but uh i think it's a powerful thing and that's that's what we want to do that's our niche so do two, you guys two, have oh sorry go ahead two questions before we go on there just in the chat before this one jumps back is do you have farmers that you intentionally put grain aside for uh, for whiskey for, for like, uh, do you have farmers that you intentionally, oh, put a grain side um, for whiskey? Like, you basically just use all your own grain, basically, correct? Yeah, exactly. Okay. So we have the ability to store our own and know where it's at. We actually have uh, minimum quality standards as far as on test weight, et cetera, on our grains that are mm-hmm. would make um, most distillers. Like, I mean, I this is crass, guys, and I apologize, but... Um, many of my buddies have told me, I'm like a distiller's wet dream. Does that make sense? Like <laughs> I have, I not only, I, we're completely vertically integrated. So, and on top of that, like, this is how ridiculous this is. Uh, in nine months, I can grow any grain I want on the planet. But not only that, I get to grow it on literally the best black dirt on planet Earth. Like West Central Indiana, uh, East Central Illinois is like God's country. That's the most expensive farm ground on literally on planet earth it is you know where the glaciers ended at the end of the ice age all i mean our topsoil is i mean we can grow i mean we grow the most ridiculous there's a cool we just released a t-shirt in the tasting room uh from i'm gonna butcher these these numbers here but it's like late 1890s to early um 1913 there were like 20 some years of the international corn king which is this uh It was basically a competition of the biggest ear of corn on on planet Earth. And I forget, it's like 13 years or something that the competition went on. Went on, And uh, three families in Newtown won it four times in the 13 years. 
you know, in Newtown. Like, what? How's how's that possible? But uh, it's just it's super cool. We have kind of this really. I mean, the grains we make, the the farming family. So obviously, we're very interconnected. To answer this gentleman's question, we're very connected with our local agriculture scene because that's what we do they bring all their grain to us um we actually here's a common question that i get asked so people understand because if you're just if you're not in the ag industry you don't understand we i'm not a farmer i don't farm anything uh it is my my family ground is custom cropped by farmers that actually we 50 50 with them which is unheard of that that hasn't happened for a year so we actually split the profits of the farm 50 percent with them because uh and we we farm with a family called the myerses uh gene myers is the is the captain of that ship and he has a bunch of sons that are all uh my brothers and i eyes age and we owe a ton to them in that um i don't have time to farm it does that make sense with a middleman for farming that's what we do that's what we commoditize grain so we sell corn to frito-lay to make corn chips we sell organic blue corn to testitos to make organic blue chips organic blue corn chips you know i mean this is what we do um and these guys just take the pride and have farmed that the the main family farm uh they have farmed that for uh, years and you know 40 plus years uh so uh, my grandpa bought that 92 was just a hobby farm um for instance we have some uh cool organic blue corn uh coming off like the so our family uh the fruits family farm uh we just got our uh 100 year farming certificate two years ago so this year would be 103 years that that farm has been farmed or and owned and actively farmed by the fruits which is pretty cool that's insane wow, that's cool that's, that's awesome, awesome. Yeah. and emily chambers wants to let you know that uh we like crass and you don't have to apologize <laughs> <laughs> i uh yeah i can get a little uh explicit so my ask my 10 year old he corrects me we use reverse psychology on him so he always says dad you're gonna go to jail. Come on, you know. So still ten years old, I'm gonna go to prison for dropping an F bomb. So that's good. He's, he's learning right. So have you guys already identified the the? You say you're gonna make a rye. Is it a rye that that's on the farm, or you you identify where you're we'll gonna farm get it? it? If we if we do it, we'll farm it. I I've got some ideas. I actually have some access that I I can't really talk about to some really cool rye from Pennsylvania that is uh I mean okay. like the rye um which is super cool i mean we just have the ability to be able to do that to grow it and, and it will grow we'll overwinter it is what we'll probably do and then we'll probably have to mess with it a little bit to make sure that i can um that it produces well you know i mean because it's always interesting to see yeah you know from those different environments how, how it does uh we like our bar you know um the barley product that we use we did the same thing like that was you know we used some kanban that was uh you know uh the the guy that farmed that for us, he, he, you know, he spent a couple of years perfecting that, you know what I mean? So it's pretty interesting. That is neat. Now just stepping a little bit away from, away from the grains, which we know are awesome. How do you, do you guys use specific yeast strains and do you guys feel like they play a, a big factor or not so big factor in the distilling process? Absolutely. So we use four proprietary yeast and uh, six proprietary enzymes is what okay. we use. So, um, uh, we use in our malted in our single malt, we use, it's a hundred percent malted barley, but I actually, if you guys, um, I don't know how much you know about our mash bills, but both of the bourbon mash bills, uh, that we currently mm -hmm. have, like the weeder that you guys are using mm -hmm. that you're drinking right mm -hmm. now, um, that I'm drinking as well. Cause I just switched to bottom and bond as well. Um, that is 80% corn and that's number two yellow field dent corn. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, GMO roundup ready, delicious, like amazing golden delicious corn i get razzed all the time by uh um people that are like you guys don't use organic grains and i'm like no they're like why and i'm like because they're shit like i don't know what to say <laughs> like i mean well our, our organic that's terrible but our organic and they are not and we're getting we're, we got some we literally have a farmer up the road from us that is electrifying he has a like this a ridiculous piece of equipment and it literally goes between the rows and he drives it twice a year and it'll electrocute all the weeds. Like we're, we, I, That's my, crazy. my cousin, Oh, it is crazy. <laughs> like, but they're trying to do everything they can to keep this stuff organic. And the truth of the matter is, is, um, so my favorite is we went to uh whiskey fest in Chicago the first year. And this lady with a like little Pomeranian purse dog, asked me if, if our grains were organic. And so for instance, like our sweet corn is technically, uh, it's non-GMO seed and it's organically raised. 
And I'm like, but we, and she's like, well, why wouldn't you put an organic tag on? I'm like, because it's not really what we do. And she's like, well, you don't want to use organic grains. And I'm like, and our standard bourbon? No. And she's like, why? She's like, oh, and you know, and she kind of gets on her pulp a little bit. I said, I don't think you really understand what genetically modified means. And she goes, what do you mean? And I said, do you see that thing that is in your purse? And she's like, yeah. I said, that was a wolf, you know, and now it is that. <laughs> That is genetic <laughs> modification at its best. It's, there's not some crazy, you know, mad scientist in the lab with CRISPR changing DNA and doing, you know, I mean, like, you know, I mean, uh, corn was originally maize. It was a grass that was this tall. And, I, I, you know, I, I saw some bl bloody butcher this year that was 12 and a half foot tall. You know, what I mean, like it's insanity. So we have just genetically modified that through crossbreeding and you know i mean and and hybrid crops and everything else to make the best because we're looking for starch does that make sense so mm -hmm. if i want to make so so this is actually segues perfectly back into your question on um um yeast and uh enzymes etc so we actually so in that 80 percent corn 20 percent soft red winter wheat mash bill that you guys are drinking now um, which is my favorite by the way um, we, we have no malted barley in there because I enzyme it. We have six proprietary enzymes and I'm basically enzyming it anyway. And the reason that I'm doing all that is efficiency. Okay. So we take a hundred percent heart cut. So I, I keep about a third of what any other distiller probably on the planet keeps. And the reason I do that is I always say this, I can't compete on volume. Um, I have to compete on quality. So if you wonder why, I can give you, I don't even remember, on the evil pick, what's the what's the proof on that? Uh, the evil pick is 55.5. So it's not even that high, so it's 111, okay? But for 111, is it not ridiculously smooth? You know what I mean? Um, um, it, it, uh, it horribly drinks easily. <laughs> exactly, exactly. It's, so that's it's amazing. We, yeah, well, so that's what we want to do. Like, we... That, you know, like I, the proof is in the pudding, right? And that is a, that's a double entendre on purpose. You know, like I, um, we take this heart cut where there's no tails in there whatsoever. So those, those, those fusel oil, those heavy toners at the end, like we, we don't use them. I don't like the taste of them. And the reason nobody else does that is nobody else can afford to do it. And the only reason I can afford it is I told you guys, I'm the world's biggest spoiled asshole. I'm vertically integrated. I can make cuts on alcohol that nobody else can because I own it from field to bottle. I do it all. And so to that point, uh, we use that, uh, you know, uh, the yeast are hugely important because I keep so little of that cut that I want that tiny little cut to be as big as possible. So we use some super aggressive yeast and, and the, you know, some of our targeted for us. Like uh, we, man, we messed for two and a half, almost three years trying to build a yeast for that sweet corn. And we just gave up, man, because it's the, it's the world's devil crop. But I hope you guys enjoy it. So, you know, <laughs> it's just, uh, yeah. <laughs> Talk to us a little bit about the sweet. Yeah, talk to us a little bit about the sweet corn because I, I heard your conversation with Alan Bishop on Distillers talk about that, and I thought it was pretty uh, hilarious and fascinating at the same time. Just how much this so, is, as you said, it's a pain in your ass. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the sweet corn, I say, is a love hate relationship. Everybody loves it, and I hate it. Um, that's just how it is. So, yeah. um, and the reason for it is this: people always ask, like, you know, we command a pretty high price uh, for that sweet corn. Um, and, uh, people are always like, why? And I'm, and then I explain it to them. They're like, oh, that makes sense. The reason is we're the only <laughs> ones on the planet that make that product. And I always say this, you will hear me say it to the day I'm dead. We're the only ones that make that product because we're the only ones dumb enough to make that product. So <laughs> it is, it is just obnoxious. So what's actually cool is in the next month and I'll have to get you guys a bottle up and we'll have to do something again, um, here in the next month or two. But, uh, uh, within the month, uh, the bottles are actually, uh, I'm getting the test bottle tomorrow. So, um, we're just working on design right now. The whiskey's ready. Um, so, uh, we're going to bottle and bomb that sweet corn as well, which will be super cool. So for four, four plus years, about four and a half years now with a uh, hundred proof and it'll just be awesome. We've, we've only released it as an 80 proof whiskey, which is, uh, I mean, guys, I'll be honest, like. 80 proof whiskey doesn't do it for me. That's probably the biggest complaint about it. And I agree. And so we're going to go up to hundred proof and then we're actually going to make that barrel strength release a yearly thing. So we're going to go full, oh. full crazy on that uh, release and, and doozy it up wow. and put it in a bottle. Glenn Karn is helping us make a, a custom crystal decanter for it. It's going to be super cool, which will be That's fun. That's cool. So, Sorry. I get excited. Sorry. No, no, no. So this <laughs> yeah. is what the sweet corn is. So, 
this is the sweet corn is a hundred percent uh and, and i'll kind of slide it up here this is actually Hold on, right here let me get you a big screener there you go uh so this is a hundred percent corn mash bill uh but instead of regular field yellow field corn this is corn on the cob sweet corn just like we would eat off the cob so people always ask why nobody else does this um there's kind of there's three reasons so the first reason is um the cost of the grain itself is um asinine so uh we do um uh so a bushel of corn right now is four dollars so that's 56 pounds for anybody in the um uh, agricultural world um they'll know that that's 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 the unit that we measure and sell on the chicago board of trade um mm -hmm. uh so 56 pounds of regular filled dent corn that uh that you know mgp and brown foreman and sazerac company and all of its distillers you're all using is four dollars that's what they're paying um uh uh 50 pounds of this cost me in last year in in, in 2020 cost me 1400 dollars so <laughs> so for a 2000 pound batch you know we're talking tens of thousands of dollars to make a single batch it's absolutely unaffordable so once again this is where the fruits family steps in and we do what we do is i bought last year i bought um you know uh twenty eight hundred dollars worth to 100 pounds and that plants me and we've done that for this will be uh we'll get ready to plant that in a couple like uh april we'll put that in the ground in april late april just depends on weather um and that will be the eighth year that we've planted uh seventh year we planted 14 acres the very first year we planted seven acres just one bag um and we use that i always joke my uh my 10 year old owen he um swears that one day he's going to eat all 14 acres if you stood in the middle of 14 acres it's as about as long you know it's basically everything you can see okay and i'm like dude you don't stand a chance but i i like that that's where you, you think you're gonna pull it off so that's pretty cool uh <laughs> But uh, so we grow that and then we let it. So so and and then that is the first. So the, the initial cost is the is the biggest barrier. So let's just say, you know, because these these big distillers, they have they have ground um, right now. Uh, an Indiana company, uh, Bex Hybrids, which is our close friends of us. They're awesome. Uh, we actually buy. We did before last year. We bought all the sweet corn. It wasn't their seed, but we bought it from Bex Hybrids. They have a um, their that the the Bex family and uh, um, Heaven Hill are working on some stuff that they're growing just for them. You know, what I mean, like on the property there, and it's like, you know, I mean, it's nothing compared to the acreage that we do, but it's it is what it is. And um, we um, uh, that they. Um, you know, so let's say that they could grow sweet corn in any mm -hmm. volume. The problem is they have to, they got to know how to handle it and you have to dry it. So uh, sweet corn is, we are using it for a purpose. It is not genetically made. Tender. So, you know, yeah, it's, 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 it, it, you know, you eat sweet corn when it's ripe and it's juicy and all the moisture is in there. And that's good. That's not what we do with filled dent corn. And on top of that, you know, people are like, well, why don't you just mash it when it's wet? This, that's not a bourbon. Bourbon has to be made from a cereal grain. I have to dry it down. This is These are the rules, you know? So we let it fill dry. I call it like the witching hour. So there's about a week. Uh, and for instance, this past year, uh, I got a wagon. We usually do, you know, six to seven wagons of sweet corn. We got maybe half of a wagon this year. It'll be the worst we've ever done as far as production. And that's just how it is because um, – you, uh, you know, it falls down. The whole field looks like Armageddon. Like, I mean, mm -hmm. it's the crappiest field of corn you've ever seen. And, you know, the second year we ever did it, we did $80,000 worth of damage to a brand new case combine trying to get it off the ground. Like, trust me, that'll, that'll make your dad blush when, you know, <laughs> you're like, oh, my gosh. So uh, we have definitely learned our lesson with this. That's where the Myers has come in. Like, they have, you know, that this is why it's awesome to have custom croppers that take pride and want to do this and, and are as proud as we are to see this product because they help us make it. You know what I mean? So uh, we dried up. Uh, we had two years ago, it came out of the field at 80% moisture. So we dry it on these peanut carts and I basically oh. molt it, man. I climb in there. It is the most, the redneckery that goes into drying this damn stuff down <laughs> and getting it to where I can then distill it is obnoxious. And then, so we get it all dried down and stable. And then I basically distill it as fast as I possibly can before it just decide before every bug and critter in Fountain County decides to breed in it, to be totally honest. So then we, I rush it in and I distill it. And this is the worst part. This is the biggest cost to us is it's not efficient. There's no, have, you, have any of you guys ever, or anybody listening ever 
planted um, uh, sweet corn seed in your garden? Yes, I used to do some organic farming mm -hmm. and stuff, or my, my friend's dad did. So, yeah, we did that a little bit. Yeah, you know, you remember how the seed looks like? It looks terrible, right? It's like the yes. ugliest seed you've ever seen. That's exactly, yep. you can come on the floor right now and see sweet corn that looks exactly like that. And I have super totes full of it from the farm that are get, that I'm, I'm getting ready to run through. And it is just, um, it's obnoxious, man. Like there's no, there's no starch in it. Does that make sense? So mm -hmm. I can, I can only fit about a third of the grain that I would in a normal mash bill. And then when I distill it, uh, you know, uh, I've had, a, I've had most distillations run over 12 hours. That's almost twice as long as a normal distillation for us. Um, and I get a third of the juice. So the biggest cost, this is what I tell people. The biggest cost to us is what I call um, opportunity loss. So um, in the time, so uh, the, the the year before last year, it took me seven weeks to distill um, the whole, which was a, which was actually a nice, uh, a pretty decent uh, year. And I made 19 barrels, 19 single barrels in seven weeks. In seven weeks, I can make 150 Ooh. barrels of bourbon, like easy, like not even trying on my free time. Uh, so it cost me half a million dollars to make sweet corn because and that's why everybody when it comes to the tours like well why don't you just buy another still and just do that one and i'm like because we just make more bourbon on that one too because yeah. that, that's that's what you do that's the correct business, right. business decision so um but we um the reason we make it is because um it's delicious guys i mean it's fun it's it literally tastes like nothing you've ever had it's awesome and um trust me if it was boring or gimmicky i would I would not have, we would not be doing this for the eighth year. You know what I mean? I would be like, get the hell out of here. I'm done with you. So, um, but, uh, it's cool. It's neat. It's something that we can show what, what my family can do that nobody else can do. You know what I mean? That nobody else can afford to do. It's arguable whether we can afford to do it, but you know, Hey, thanks dad. I, 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 Thank I, you, dad. Don't, <laughs> I don't know if this is the question, but is corn smut a concern with sweet corn? Say that again as what? Corn smut a concern with sweet corn. When you say smut, what do you mean? I'm not sure. I was reading a question from the from the chat. So, we'll, do you mean like spoilage? Ask them if they mean. Well, I mean they're listening. So, yeah. um, see if their response is if if they mean like spoilage. Let, let's lean that way. That would be my assumption. I would agree. So, um, yeah. so I mean we, that's what my family does. We store grain. Uh, my dad's been doing it for oh, Lord. I mean coming up on uh shoot what is it 54 years so um we do a really good job of making sure that we don't have spoilage and once again that's kind of goes back to the second reason that we can do this nobody else can that's what we do um we had um we had last year so the only reason i got 19 barrels this past year was because we had an entire one of the entire wagons we put too much on and got a little too aggressive in it and it it, it spoiled does that make sense? It was done. Mm -hmm. So we, so here's the best thing. There's no easy auger out way to get. So whether it is good or bad, I have to crawl in there with a grain vac and suck it all out. And we just suck it all out to throw it away in one, or we suck it all out to distill it. It's like literally getting punched in the face. You know, like it, you're like, this is awesome. We can't find a better way to do this. And the answer is really no. You know, I mean, for the for the volume that we're doing, there's just no efficient way. I mean, even a larger volume, there's no efficient way to do this. That's why it's, you know, it will always be an allocated seasonal. This is what we're going to have, but it's fun. Like I said, it, the coolest thing about it is I, pro I literally promise you that you've never had a whiskey like it ever. It is. Oh, oh, and, and more specifically a bourbon. And I, I call it like a, it's like our spotted unicorn. It's a really cool, uh, I, like I always joke, my brothers will, uh, like my older brother, he loves the barrel strength sweet corn. And I love it too. It is, it is actually delicious. I'm, I'm going to pour another one here. Uh, but uh, it is, I always say this. So uh, my favorite thing we make is the barrel strength, like the evil pick that you guys have right now from ABV. That's just my favorite thing we make. Um, I love the history of us releasing that bottled and bond at four years. Uh, Cause all the, all the barrel strengths are four year plus picks too. But this uh, barrel strength is, I always say this, it's like a, so I always say the sweet corn, it's like a spotted unicorn. Uh, and I, I, the, the, the tasting notes on the, on the sweet corn, I always say is it's, it's like a, it's like a really cool, it's a one trick pony. Um, it's the coolest magical pony on the whole world. You know what I mean? But it, 
It just has one trick. Does that make sense? And it's kind of like, mm-hmm. and people go gaga all over it. You know what I mean? I've never had anybody try it and say, that's not good. You know what I mean? But um, I've had people that would be like, I like bourbon better. And I'm like, oh, I, I'm more of a bourbon fan. That doesn't really taste like bourbon. And I agree with him. Like, I'm like, yeah, I'm with you. I'll take a weeder almost any day over sweet corn. But man, the sweet corn bourbon is, I mean, it's pretty, the at cast strength is just, uh, it's pretty magical and just because it is like you i mean you will try it and you'll be like what in the hell did i just pour in my mouth it is you know <laughs> I, mean, I mean this is this is 117.8 proof and i guarantee you that um and i don't know how well you can see the color on this and the lighting in this room is terrible but this is pretty this dark. reddish tint as dark as sin and it is um it is just so the tasting notes on this it's just um, I get Cracker Jacks on the front end, this this buttery, oily popcorn middle because the uh, just the this is a very estery, just because it distills so slow, it's very estery. Like even on the nose, sometimes, and this is off putting, I, 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 but I just tell people I'm honest. Like a lot of times on the nose on this, if it's especially in the 80 proof whiskey, I get like magic marker, like about 50 percent like uh, if i take the first sip the magic marker and then i'll smell the particulars in it but like the first smell Mm -hmm. i'll be like oh god that smells awful but it is super oily because of those esters and then my favorite part and i love the story because i love to tell awesome stories about my dad because he's the best but um uh we were bottling this the first time oh my god five years ago and uh, we, we had it in the um, basically the barreling tank. So we had pumped it out of the barrel and into there, the first one. And I'm standing over the top of it. So I'm on a ladder like 10 foot in the air and I'm smelling. I'm like, God, I know that smell, but I can't. I just can't put my nose on it. My brothers got up there and they're clueless. And uh, my sister was in D.C. at the time. And um, I'm like, Dad, come over here and smell this. And my dad is, he's like, you know, like he's the dad that like we all had to the 10th degree right so my dad knows everything like he's the smartest man i've ever met like everything he knows oh yeah i've done that before let me do that real quick Boop. so i'm like pops come over here and smell this and he's like i don't know what it's gonna smell like i don't even drink and i'm like just come over and smell this and i literally just browbeat him until he climbed up the ladder and this way he climbs up the step puts his nose over and he goes oh that's kind of pretty because he's looking down into the tank of the of the bourbon you know 10 foot in the air and he goes oh that's bubblicious bubble gum and I'm like, Jesus, are you freaking kidding me? That's exactly what I get. That's the smell. So uh, the, the finish on the sweet corn is, and people always say that they'll get cotton candy. And this, this, um, there's these strong bubblegum notes. And I always like to explain it this way. It's not bubblegum chewed bubblegum. It's when you open the wrapper or you open a mm. thing, a big league chew, and that yeah. powdered sugar bubblegum smell. That yeah. is the finish on this. And it is just like, man, when I drink this, like yes. this is, uh, this is seriously like, t-ball you know six years old like five years old whenever you play t- babe ruth baseball you know in middle school like <clears throat> that's what it reminds me of it's just awesome there's a lot of americana in here it's yeah. pretty cool the big league chew is something i think we we hit across when we were when we were tasting yeah. and i was like yeah i re- this i remember that smell this is like oh, you yeah. said exactly it's like Shh, right before everyone wants to take yep. some from you <laughs> absolutely <laughs> Absolutely. So I have a question about so what, so what, um, what barrels stuff. are you using? Oh, um, we use all of our cooperage comes from um, the barrel mill. Uh, you're actually sitting on a barrel right here. Um, so we use. Um, so here's here's where the weirdness comes in with the barrels. So we age everything underground in a basement. I have tens of thousands of square foot underground. Um, we mm-hmm. don't actively control the temperature down there. But as far as I know, I am the only um distillery in north america let alone bourbon distillery that ages all of their barrels underground um so we Mm. age everything down there and then to kind of fight that and because there's only 16 degrees so you know traditional kentucky rick house 100 plus degrees of temperature variation that's good makes barrel expansion uh speeds up aging all those things are good um i have 16 degrees down there so if it's oh gosh it's like uh what is it? I'll tell you. It's 28 degrees here in basically Indianapolis. If it's zero outside, the coldest it's ever gotten in that basement is 50, and the warmest it's ever got is 66. So it's a wow. super hey, flat. Science. That's actually kind of kind of nice for for being able to blend and stuff. Things shouldn't get too out of hand from each other. Well, being so that close. here's a perfect example. So people will always other distillers. Everybody will be like, man. 
I buy your barrel picks all over the place, and they are noticeably different, but the consistency in your, like, you know, uh, like Bottled and Bond, for instance, like, is just, like, how do you do it? And I'm like, they're like, you're a genius. And I'm like, no, no, I'm a friggin' moron. Uh, I cheat. The basement is how I can't <laughs> make consistent. I mean, I cheat. There's no, there's no, like, ifs, ands, or buts about it. Now, there's a double-edged sword there, you know. So to that point, to back to the barrel question, uh, we use the barrel mill. Uh, they are kind of known that they make expensive barrels. We love them. Um, they they kind of have this proprietary. It's a German beer barrel, B I E R. Um, it's kind of disappeared from the planet for 150 years, and they brought it back. And the reason nobody uses it is because it's basically as expensive to make as a 53, and you can hold twice as much booze in a 53. Why would you ever do that? Well. I'll tell you one reason you would use a 30 instead of a 53 is you have a basement that you can plug thousands of barrels into. And uh, I always say this, we would have, you know, to that effect, we would have the only single barreled, you know, 13, 14 year old bourbon in the world. And I would be dead right now because my dad murdered me because we had no, nothing to sell. Does that make sense? So we used a 30 gallon barrel um, to speed up. Um, well, to add flavor. So I always, I want people to understand this too, because I, I think this is misunderstood. So smaller barrels do not age whiskey faster. That's the wrong semantics there. Okay. Age is time is time. Okay. Mm -hmm. There are things that only, there are things chemistry wise and we can, I mean, we, I can nerd out as much as you want, like right now. Like, I mean, the, the chemistry of this is, is, is there. Okay. Like there's a certain amount of time that needs to pass for certain alcohols to disappear in your angel share. And that is going to affect yeah. the taste of, you know, I mean, uh, I forgot, I think it's Eddie Russell that said, you know, you, you spend, you spend the first two years getting rid of all the bad things I did when I distilled it or whatever, you know what I mean? So <laughs> like in, in the traditional pot distilling, I agree a hundred percent with that. Mm -hmm. um, but um, what we do is, you know, everything is going to bottle and bond for us. We want four plus years. And the easiest way to say this in layman's term, just to make it easy, is I make better whiskey faster than anybody else can. And the reason I do that is a bunch of steps. It's not the basement, although that's a big part of it. I take the best cuts. I have the best alcohols going into barrels. I use the best grains that I farm on my own field so I can pick test weights, 60 pound plus corn. I have like freaking Hulk corn. You know what I mean? Like we only take the best stuff. I, you know, we use the best enzymes. I spare literally no expense to make the best whiskey I possibly can. And then I put it in a 30 gallon barrel and I age it for, uh, um, you know, four plus years. And the idea with that is, is of the smaller barrel does not, time is time, we're getting back to that, like age is age, okay? But what um, that smaller barrel is doing is just physics. It's imparting flavor faster. So like I'm I'm meeting uh -huh. in the middle. Does that make sense? So I, I always mm -hmm. like to say this, if you take somebody like Alan um, or um, uh, anybody, you take like a Scotch master blender, you know, like those guys are freaking amazing. You know what I mean? That's not what I do. Like if you, I'm not saying I couldn't, I, mean, I think I have a pretty good palate and I could learn, but it would take me years to learn to blend whiskeys to the level that Alan does. Okay. That's not what I do. You could, I always like to say this. If you gave the world's best master blender with the best palate um, access to all the whiskeys on the planet, in my opinion, he would make the best whiskey any of us have ever seen. And we would all see Jesus, you know, it would be, it would be amazing. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, well, that's never going to happen, but uh, to that point where I will put my flag in the ground and I'll stomp around is I'll say, bring me your best 10 single barrels and we'll go to town all day because my product is going to be more consistent. And I, and I don't have 10 barrels because I have thousands of barrels that taste exactly like this. You're going to pick your best 10. Like how, how many barrels you want to bring? You know what I mean? There's a really, <laughs> like, I mean, that's what we do. Super consistent. You know what I mean? Like we, I always get asked this whenever we have the big guys out to the distillery um, poking around, which is happens all the time. Um, you know, they always say, well, like, have you had a bad, I always get asked this by every master distiller. Um, they say, well, have you had a bad batch yet? And I'm like, what do you mean? They're like, have you, ha have you had any bad product out yet? And I'm like, no. They're like, I'll just wait. And I'm like, I don't think you guys understand. Like, I'm not an itinerant distiller. Like, this is my business. I'm the CEO and owner of this, okay? Do you want to know who fills those barrels over there? And they're like, no. I'm like, I don't pay a guy with a gas pump 
you know, at the bonded facility <laughs> with a gas and to overflow those barrels and pump. And there's nothing wrong with that. I'm not saying, you know, I mean, like, thank God for that dude getting paid $16 mm -hmm. an hour to do that. Like, I'm all for making jobs. I'm just like, guys, like, I won't make bad. I know exactly what is in that basement because I made it all. Like, you're literally looking at the dude that made my older brother helped me. You know what I mean? And that poor guy, like, I was over his shoulder micromanaging the shit out of him. So thank you, Chris. <laughs> thank you. You know what I mean? So, like, yeah, uh, there is – you're looking at the guy that did it all, and they're like, oh. And I'm like, that is – you know, so we always get asked. I mean, that's kind of a segue into the next part is they, they'll always say, well, you know, because we have a large still. We, we have – I mean, we're – not even close to capacity. You know what I mean? That's the first thing these big guys, they're like, oh my God, why are you not making, you know, 5,000 barrels a year? You have the capacity to do that. And I'm like, because it's me. And they're like, what? And I'm like, I don't have investors. There's no, once again, world's biggest spoiled asshole. I cannot, ex luckiest guy on the planet. I don't, my dad and I, I and my brothers own this. Like it's not, there's no investors. It's paid for. We can grow at our own pace. And once again, my dad gets all the credit for this. The man doesn't even drink. And I told him seven years ago, I said, Pops, you know, we can do this and we can be like everybody else. And um, I mean, I just kind of have a, I'm a super competitive guy. I always was a lot of well into sports. And I like, I just, I don't know. I'm just very anal about the way I do things. I asked my poor wife and uh, uh, I, you know, I said, dad, I have no interest in being like an Indiana distillery. You know, I mean, I want to make the best bourbon we possibly can. And he said, yeah, that sounds good. And, you know, seven years of doing this craziness, he's never he's never stumbled once. He gave me every stinking tool I needed to make the best. I mean, at every turn. Every time we've made money, we've spent it to reinvest in, hey, I need a little bit here. And, man, that guy, you know, yeah, like I said, he's – He's the best, and that, and, and he let me chase, he let me chase that, and uh, it's all because of him. It has nothing to do with me, man. Like I said, I'm just the product of some badass Americans, man, that made that put me here. And it's he gets all the credit, and the man doesn't even drink. You know what I mean? He he just said, yeah, chase, chase the best thing, because I said we need to be competitive and to make what we need to do and to do what I want to do. I want to at least try, and I don't know if it's going to work. So here's the craziest thing. I mean, I told him up front, I was like, I could do the best job I possibly could and make the best thing we possibly could, and it could still be meh, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, he was like, well, let's see. And, uh, you know, kudos to, uh, you know, having the best dad on the planet. That's what I say. Yeah. I, hey, it's, it's always good to have that support but and, um, when you're doing anything. Now, a couple quick questions. I was going to say, someone want, uh, Nathan was asking questions about your still. And since we're, if we're going to talk about your still, I wanted everyone to kind of understand how much of a cut you make compared to other people, like how much you actually get out of, out of a run compared to other people when, when you're making it. Cause I, that really surprised me when I found out about it. Yeah. So we have a Coda still from Iceland in Germany. Uh, it is completely custom made for us. It's the only one like it in the world. Um, it's a three tower, 19 bubble plate hybrid reflux system. So it has a traditional pot still attached to, uh, um, a three tower system that I can, uh, with automation that we're one of the few on the planet that have this automation system. I mean, I, I, once again, dad, like providing all the tools we have just, I mean, I, I often call it the, uh, starship enterprise. I mean, it is just a cool it is a cool piece of technology. It just gives me lots of flexibility. I mean, we let, we even have like a flavoring basket on it. I've never used it. You know what I mean? So we can literally make anything I wanted on this thing. Um, and uh, um, we just, like I said, we take a hundred percent heart cut. So, I mean, if I went to, uh, if we, so we just put in a brand new glycol um, system. And if I went to full cuts, um like everybody else does and we went to four distillations a day i would make 75 to 100 barrels a day That's so tight. um we make two barrels a day right now just to let you know and that's me that's me running one distillation like maybe five days a week uh, and, that, and that's not fair like we're uh well so 
here's the thing with family businesses. My dad has uh, 28 nitrogen for fertilizer that we have to haul from the port of Cincinnati. So uh, he has my semi truck tanker, which, by the way, uh, my semi truck tanker is his. He owns it. It's not mine. So <laughs> he can use it for whatever he wants. So, uh, so we've been running uh, two tankers to Cincinnati basically every day to finish this contract off to bring uh, basically 28 liquid nitrogen back for fertilizer. Um, uh, and when that's done, uh, you know, I will get back to distilling more than, you know, we'll go back to full blast and we'll be, we'll be good to go. But, you know, we've never been up to capacity. We have, you know, um, just an ability to make a lot more whiskey than we are right now, but it's at the point it is, um, once again, the, the concentration is on, you know, is on quality. You know I mean? We mm-hmm. want to make it. I don't, I've never, I remember how I told you guys before we started like 2021 is going to be the the year of me um, uh, um, well, divesting or, or finding delegating to everybody else. Uh, mm-hmm. The uh, I will not be delegating any uh, distilling, but uh, <laughs> I'm going to delegate all the hundreds of other tasks that I have uh, to hopefully be able to concentrate on just distilling. And then, and to be honest, like I'm going to have to find another distiller here probably in the next, and I, I've got my eyes on a couple dudes, but like, I think in the next two or three years, I'm gonna have to find somebody to kind of step into my shoes so I can do, so I can distill, so I can sell all the whiskey we're going to be making over the next, you know, four years. You know what I mean? So, yeah. so sometimes it's, it's got to pay off to be the head of the, the head and the face of everything, you know, it's got to, it's got to pay off or yeah. you get a, a little freedom for that a little bit. Uh, I, see, I, I think I would argue the opposite, man. I've been looking at my dad working his butt off. I don't think it ever pays off, man. The <laughs> buck stops with him and then it stops with me so and and you know what like like i said like you know i i wouldn't as much as you know like my wife will pro she gets all the credit here man i i love her to death like she will say it she'll be like man you know she'll be like you should you should probably like let somebody else do that or you should do this or whatever and i'll be like well and i'll get to the end and then i'll get on the train i'll be like yeah i need to delegate better and I need to let somebody else have it here, and she's like, "Whatever, you love it." You know, what I mean, like, dude, I mean, I'm a control freak. You know, what I mean, I, I admit it. I understand, like, you know, my poor sister. She's been working in the tasting room for about a year and a half, and uh, she's dealt with all of my moods and everything. And she's, you know, after after my wife reaches sainthood, I think she's gonna get the next one because she has to deal with me. So, uh, but she does a good job of uh really I, well i'll tell you this man my my sister she's the only girl there's four of us and she's the she's the youngest the la, the last my younger brother and sister are twins and she was born six minutes after my brother so um she's also she says she's five twelve. um so we're all enormous human beings you know what i mean and she's she refuses to say she's six foot but she's five twelve, <laughs> and she is uh she's awesome man and i, I just laugh so uh, we've had many conversations this year i'll just leave it at this and i'll say Ashley, like, just because I say something, like, doesn't mean mean that you need to have an emotional reaction to it. You know what I mean? Sometimes it's just me <laughs> saying something. It's the truth. It might be hurtful. I'm not saying it to hurt your feelings. Like, we need we've we've had a lot of growing in the last two years, man. And she's, like I said, she deserves. Uh, everybody deserves a little sainthood for dealing with me, man. I am I'm definitely particular, but uh, you know, God bless them for dealing with me, right? So. <laughs> so what what's your distribution like and what's the I, I know i've seen your stuff on seal box but is there anyone else that does online sales of the products so we had another partner that was doing online but we pulled that back to be honest here's the problem um so we were in uh statewide in kentucky which we still are statewide in illinois statewide in indiana i had these big grandiose plans to be in michigan uh wisconsin minnesota yeah. Missouri and um, Tennessee, black South Carolina. And the problem is, is when you win the awards that these damn whiskeys, these bourbons have won in the last year, like Indiana and Kentucky drinks everything. So they, uh, that is where we're at right now. We're just in, we're in a demand regression, which is, uh, let me tell you guys, it's it's absolutely horrible to be wanted. You know what I mean? So, but I think the um, the the answer moving forward for me is, and we have man. I just can't explain to you guys like how fortunate I am to have, uh, you know, the distributors that I do and the people that work with us, we're just being more efficient. And so I really, I mean, our hopes, I think family wise is, um, you know, like 
uh, direct sales online. Uh, that that that's I, I think it's the future. I mean, yep. we're fighting for it. Uh, we're trying to get it done here. Um, it's coming whether whether the TTB and the the distributors that want to hold on to this three tier system want it or not. I hate to tell you, fellas, like it's going to happen. So um, we're with it's you. Just, Don't hate that. <laughs> we're, we're holding no, no, those bricks. I, I, let's, yeah, we're, I, we're, that lets me create jobs in my community for people packing boxes and lets me sell whiskey directly to my fans, and I don't have to pay a crazy markup to enormous distributors that don't give a crap about what my family's doing or anything else. Yes. You know I mean? mm-hmm. And yeah. I can, I can sell directly to my customers and my fan base. And then I don't have to hear the moans and groans and your guys' moans and groans about, man, we can't find it here. We can't get it. And I'm like, guys, <laughs> like do you, I mean, I can, we can talk distrib- distribution and three tier system for five minutes and you will be like, you need to sell that business and get into making toilet paper or something. You know what I mean? Like, why in the hell would you do the bourbon business? And I'm like, some days I wonder why, but it is, um, you know, I love it. And it's fun. And it, to be honest, like, the best thing about this business, man, is, is, is like being on here with you guys is relationships. You know what I mean? Like, bourbon people are the coolest people. Let's just be honest. You know what I mean? Yeah. I just get to make something that they love and they appreciate the way I make it. And I think... What's more freaking American than that, man? I just had a conversation. I was on, um, we just did a big podcast on American manufacturing for like, uh, it was just like a Midwest thing. And uh, we were talking and it just dawned on me in the middle of this. And I went on a tirade and I was like, you know, you know, like you want to know what's badass about my family is like, I don't make a single friggin' thing in China. You know what I mean? I make it in Newtown, Indiana and I grow it in the next county over and my family does everything. Like, and my family makes, you know, processes as, as the middleman for like, you know, I couldn't be more proud of what my family has accomplished as a far as, you know, I just look at buddies that own businesses and all these people. And I, I'm going, I'm getting on my uh, pulpit here for a second. I apologize. But, you know, I look at what my family does and I have buddies that own businesses that are great businesses and they make great products. But the supply chain is out of this country. And I'm like, guys. You want to know where my, my supply chain is? My back friggin' yard. You know what I mean? Like, that's <laughs> what we do. Like, I couldn't be more proud of the fact that I don't source whiskey from someone else. You know, even if it's American made, which is fine. And there's nothing wrong with doing that. That's the industry, as we know. But I couldn't be more proud about the way, my, the way like, my, my family has something. You know, come to Newtown. Like, the whole damn town. Look at it on Google Maps, man. Like, look at Newtown Farm Service. It's a freaking monstrosity, man. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. you can stand at the building and look at – we have a we have a corn facility that is a third the size of Lucas Oil Stadium where the Colts play football. We put seven <laughs> stories, and there's eight football fields inside of there. We put seven stories of corn in there. Like, it's freaking awesome. awesome. Like, like, my family is just badass, man, and, and they get – once again, I couldn't be more proud. Like to stand where we are in the weird year of 2020 and COVID, and all of this, man, it's been kind of an existential year. And we had, uh, you know, I don't want to brag. I I have plenty of good buddies that own bars and restaurants, and we are trying to do everything we can to help them. You know, what I mean, and I, I can't even imagine being in that position of being told you can't run your business or pay for your kids' schooling or be able to put food on the table oh my god and i'm sitting here looking at my dad like you're the smartest goddamn man i've ever met in my life you know what i mean and you are easily the hardest working one and it shows you know what i mean because look at this place it is it is ridiculous it's awesome so yeah all right now we usually don't try to keep you on too much longer than an hour but i remember that oscar had a question and and hell i'm interested too let's talk about your the single malt you were you were you discussed maybe that you put out because I, I don't know hell i'm i'm jealous and i want to know more <laughs> um, so it is the most expensive thing that we make uh the sweet corn is probably the most expensive on the back end but it's never a hard cost does that make sense the single malt is a hard cost because it um i have to pay to malt it and smoke it you know, and mm-hmm. I got to pay my malter and it is expensive. So Caleb Macholke, who is at Sugar Creek Malting Company and all you bourbon nerds uh, should mm-hmm. look him up because he is making yep. malts and all kinds of cool stuff for mostly breweries, but for distillers across the mid across the country now, man. And he uh, it, I want to I want to sing his sing his praises a little bit. So once again, I told you what I love about this business is the uh, 
is the um, uh, is the relationship. So um, I I didn't know him. I swam with his older sister. We swam club in high school. And he remembers me and my little brother. Like I said, we were we just crushed people's souls in swimming when I was in high school and uh, had since I was like, you know, grade school. And uh, he he went to a rival rival high school of mine, and he was a freshman when I was a senior. And he's like, I just remember you being this like giant dude, and you just destroyed everybody in the pool. And I'm like, dude, I never. And this is how terrible I was like. I don't remember you at all, but I always wanted to date your sister because she was pretty hot. You know, I, she was like, yeah, you know, yeah, I got that all the time. So it was just funny. So come full circle, like we're working with them. He's smoking it and malting it for us. Um, and it is a um, – so I wanted – when I told him this project, he – he. Um, so I love to do things that – I mean, it's kind of the Fruits family motto. I told you guys this. I – I love to do things that other people won't do because they're either too expensive or too hard. Does that make sense? And mm -hmm. um, I wanted to make a single malt uh, in North America, and I wanted to do it all. And not only did I want to do it all, um, but I wanted to do it all with Indiana, everything. So um, okay. it is uh, it is um, Indiana um, barley. It is um, smoked and malted in Indiana. Um, it is smoked, so it's 100% malted. Uh, and then it's a hundred percent smoked, which is super unique too, which is yeah. what makes it so stinking expensive. So it's smoked in thirds. Uh, so the first third, uh, is smoked with Indiana peat. We found in Fort Wayne, which is like Northwest Indiana. For those of you that okay. are spatial okay. and visual like me. That's, that's interesting. Of, yeah. A bunch of peat bogs across the North end of the state. Uh, so we, um, we went up there, found some peat, uh, brought it back, uh, tested it, um, it smoked a third with Indiana lavender from Southern Indiana near Bloomington where like IU is. And that is like uh, three quarters of the cost is that lavender. It is asinine. Um, I say this when we smoke that barley, it is all I can do to not grab some 2% milk and just pour it in the bag and eat it right out of there. Cause it smells like cinnamon toast crunch. It is <laughs> awesome. The, the, the lavender is the biggest part to me it is the biggest additive. And then, uh, so we found those two first. And Caleb was like, dude, that's a lot of money we have in this thing already. And I was like, no, I want a third smoke note. And we came back home actually from, uh, I actually came over to uh, his farm, to his, to his malt house um, to um, uh, taste the lavender. And uh, we had had a windstorm come through and it blew over a maple tree in his yard. And I said, dude, that's maple right there, right? And he's like, yep. And I go, I want that. We're doing it with maple, with that tree. And he's like, Done. Perfect. So we smoke it in thirds. So it's smoked, like I said, Indiana um, maple, Indiana lavender, and Indiana peat. And it is um, – so I would say this. I am not a uh, – I am not a super peaty, Isley, uh, you know, uh, Laphroaig. I, I Honestly, I, it just does nothing for me, man. Like, I, it's, it, we don't even drink it right. Like, the Scots make fun of us for drinking that straight. Okay, you're supposed to put water in it. Um we, um, I, I'm a space side guy, which makes complete sense because I love bourbon and the most bourbon esque <laughs> scotches are space side. So I wanted to make something kind of in that vein. And, um, we, this is, I, I always say, so first place of the things that I make, uh, my, our barrel strength, single barrels, if I could sell them no other way, that's the only way I would sell them. Perfect. That'd be perfect. Um, that's first place always. Second place is a three way tr tie. So, uh, barrel strength. Um, uh, um, sweet corn is tied is tied for second. Uh, the bottled and bond single barrel, just because of the history, what that means to the family, and us being able to release the second single barrel bourbon on the plant, uh, bottled and bond bourbon on the planet, and it be a state made from top to bottom is insane and super cool and shows off what we're doing. And then the, the third is the single malt. And I always say the single malt is probably the most elegant of everything that I make. It is complicated man it's it's fun it's just uh it's it's a fun and, and well uh, so and to and to throw to top off the whole thing because there's just so much depth to that product it's aged for just under four years actually i think the next batch we're going to release is going to be bottle and bond it's i'm just i was really close to four years on this last release we just won best single malt and i was i hate to tell you like i gotta pay my dad back someday so we had to make some money so i <laughs> i pulled some barrels that were pretty old and tasted delicious and um so uh well, I think that's going to bottle and bond too, but it is aged in our sweet corn barrel. So on top of it being oh. it's aged in a barrel wow. that 
doesn't exist anywhere but for us. You know what I mean? So pretty cool. And, and before you even said that, uh, Oscar said, damn, I'd sucker punch my grandmother to taste that. <laughs> don't uh, do that, man. Come on. <laughs> Come on. Don't do that. But, yeah, it, it, it's cool. so, uh, we do. We do have a little bit of bottles left at the distillery. There's not much. Uh, we aren't tasting it because – Here's the problem. And I just, I always try to be brutally honest with people. Uh, if I open a bottle to taste it, there'll be half of a bottle left. And then I will drink that at home by myself, uh, you know, when I could have made $200 on that. So I just don't even tease myself with the temptation. Like we don't cry. I'm not tasting it. You either know what it is or you don't. And I, it is going to sell out. You know what I mean? Like we literally have like two handfuls left. That's it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So, yeah. Excuse me. No, it, it it sounds absolutely delicious. Um, it's fun. It's fun. It's now like we were saying, we're we're about an hour and fifteen minutes, and, and we don't like to keep people too horribly long on, on a Monday night because we know you're already giving up a lot of your life and uh, your free time, and we really appreciate that. Um, before we go, do you have any? What are some of the releases you have coming out this year or, or in the future that people should be looking out for? Um. So. Oh man, in like a month, a uh, bottle and bond sweet corn. That'll be huge. Um, we should probably do something for that so you guys can try that and let me know what you think and I'm, get I'm, on here and talk about it. I want mm -hmm. to, yeah. I mean, that's an allocated product and it's not very much, but we want to, uh, I'm hoping that uh, direct to consumer is done by then. So, you know, everybody that wants a bottle of that can get it. So, um, that's pretty cool. Um, uh, the bottle and bond. Man, since Breaking Bad and the International Whiskey Competition and San Francisco and everything that we did, I mean, that, that whiskey just, I mean, it's been out for six months and we, my distributor has sold, if you take all the rest of my products out, uh, he has sold more Bottled and Bond than everything else he sells put together of Bottled and Bond. We went through a couple hundred barrels in like no, like in six months. It's been last nine, which is awesome i mean i can't complain uh, people are hungry for it it is delicious it's perfectly proof it's amazing i love it um i always say this so uh the barrel strength are my favorite but if i was going to pick one bottle to show off what the family's accomplished it is that bottled and bond and the reason for is twofold one the history of bottled and bond and what that means and how you can't fake it and it's it's our juice you know what i mean like we're, mm -hmm. we're one of just yeah. a few doing that um, but the second part of it is, is, um, that hundred proof man, uh, I always say this, we, we have forgot more than we know about distilling in this country. Like, uh, it's just, yeah. there's just been no way to share it down the things like Alan, you know, Alan Bishop at French Lake, man, I love that dude. He's got, oh, I love the history. I'm, I'm a history nerd mm -hmm. anyway. And <laughs> he gets so into that. And I, I agree with him. Like, and I always say this hundred proof. I mean, I want all the proof. I would say like, I, I always want give the higher the proof I'm, I'm going to like it more. But that's not everybody. So I would say this hundred proof in this bottle and bond, um, you know, Breaking Bourbon said it. They're like they said it was perfectly proofed, and I agree. Like, it is just if I want to hit the most palates, yeah. That 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 bottle and bond is just awesome. It's just a caramel vanilla bomb, and it is it's everything I think a weeder should be. You know what I mean? And it's it's awesome. I'm pretty proud of it. I'm not pretty proud. I'm ridiculously proud of it. It's awesome. So yeah, <laughs> uh, I'm trying to think what else we have. Uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, the barrel strength sweet corn will be holiday season. You guys will see that. Um, that'll be pretty cool. Like I said, we're gonna have have it in a in a box with all the craziness from Glen Carn. It'll be it'll finally be bottled the way it should be. You know, I mean, I'm gonna give it its give it its due, and we're gonna I'm gonna do a little more barrels. Like we've only ever like we only did one barrel of that this year, and it sold out in like three hours. It was gone. So um, I'm gonna do five barrels, and hopefully. Um, at the price, I can kind of get it out and about. I'm hoping it'll go fast, but that's no. How it is. Well, so and this is just something I, I was supposed to put up earlier because Mike and I were having fun with this. We just want to remember for everyone to enjoy some good Indiana bourbon. And if you don't, that's yeah. what will happen to you. <laughs> <laughs> that is amazing. Yes, yes. Uh, so if you don't follow Indiana bourbon on uh, Instagram, you should. Um, uh the the uh husband and wife that run that and um i, I won't out him who it is i mean they, they are the greatest freaking people on the planet yeah. man just seriously like awesome and, they, and they will do anything for anyone and if you are not following them you're crazy go i hope they have ten thousand more of you uh, you know people tomorrow they are 
they are awesome. They picked a barrel and they did that bombing, which is hilarious, right? Because I'm uh, I'm a Purdue uh, grad, so you know this is antithesis. But my grandpa, who I was bragging on earlier that started the female he was uh he was an iu grad and he didn't have a single kid or grandkid go to iu yet we all went to purdue so poor guy. so i i, I that, that sticker that sticker with bobby knight is on the back of my forklift and every time i see it i smile and i think of grandpa man and that's, all, that's all because of indiana bourbon man they are uh they're fantastic i i love them good once again i i can't say this enough there are no people better than bourbon people, man. And it is, I couldn't be, my family couldn't be more fortunate to be in this business and be able to, uh, you know, sit here and have conversations like this and uh, be appreciated for what we're doing, man. We appreciate you guys right back. Yeah. Well, yeah. What, what, what you're putting out of people for as young as you guys are is really, it, it is really impressive. And it, it lends to what we're saying about a lot of craft you mentioned with barrels. And sometimes people don't always get that is that, it doesn't have to be eight or 16 years old. I was going to say, there's a lot of times where we're having stuff where we'll put like a two or a four year, year old up against some things. And in a blind it's, it's kicking some ass. You know what I mean? Yep, it, yeah. it, it might not take everything, but I'm like, Oh, well you did put it up against, you know, an old Fitzgerald 13 and this is only three and a half years old. So yeah, <laughs> yeah to, absolutely. To, to be this far behind it. Sometimes I'm like, that's fucking impressive. And then, I think a lot of people are going to be taking note. And what did Ben and I also got? We got like, there's like a little burnt orange oh, yeah. zest in it. And I could not peg it, but it has, it is really bright and comes through. And, and some of it, I mean, that was like, I remember when I had the, the bottled and bond, that was like right on those. I'm like, holy shit, what is this? You know, and I'm like, and I, and I was just into like that part. And I'm like, there's other stuff going on, but I'm like, there's more to just the orange thing. There's like a burnt zest to it. Like it, it smelled like someone had almost made like a little cocktail or a little rubbed a little on the edge of the oh, glass yeah. before I had it. I always like to, I always like to explain this. Like, I think, um, you know, there is definitely age is, um, age is not always synonymous with quality. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. so, yes. Yep. Uh, Absolutely. and bring me, you know, uh, any single barrel product that I've ever tasted over nine, 10 years is God awful. I'll just be totally honest with you. It's just, it's like you might as well get a bag of uh, brick charcoal and let me go at it. You know, what I mean, it's just and 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 I hate to tell you, like I don't want to burst anybody's bubble, but like we as distillers know that. That's why it's a blended product. Like there's not all thirteen year old stuff. Yeah, in, you know, what I mean, like uh, and and it's to my argument. I want people to know what it is that we do. You know, and mm -hmm. um, because uh, I get that question very uh, like very frequently. Uh, are you guys going to leave anything longer? And like, I have some seven year old barrels that are in 53s, by the way, too, not 30s that are in the basement. And they're like, oh my God, how is it? And I'm like, it's all right. Like, I, I mean, I don't, I don't, I mean, this sounds a bit facetious come from me, but I don't think I, well, okay. I don't make bad whiskey. I will say that, like, but I don't make bad whiskey because I'd be a total blunt. I mean, I'm a pretty, I'm pretty much an idiot, but I'd be a totally idiot if I made on the equipment that I have been afforded and what we, how we do things. You know what I mean? Uh, we mm -hmm. purposely try to make the best thing that we do. And um, if I can make, if I can make four year old bottled and bond product that is scoring as high as William LaRue Weller antique collection uh, or is, you know, the third best bourbon on the planet, you know, and the biggest whiskey competitions on the planet. I, I hate to tell you guys, like at some point, this has got to be a business. Like I, I figured something out, you know what I mean? Those <laughs> products are 16 years old. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. plus I did it for, I just did it on a fourth of the time. Why do you think all the big distilleries, you know, are like, what, what are you doing in Newtown? Indiana? Well, how's this? I've had your problem. Well, what are you, what are you doing? And I always say this, man, it's accidentally on purpose. Does that make sense? Like we, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, I, I mean, I did all of this was thoughtful and purposeful, but I lucked into the basement. You know what I mean? I lucked into being born into the Osmus family of all time. You know what I mean? And, mm -hmm. uh, the Osmus family, a hardworking, like, you know, get stuff done. People you've ever met, man. There was, we don't, uh, people always ask us all the time, like, you know, how, how many, how many employees do you guys have? And I'm like, technically we don't have a single employee. And they're like, what? I'm like, we pay my sister as a consultant and the other three are owners. That's it. It's all family. You know what I mean? Like when we bottle, we'll bottle the bottled and bond sweet corn uh, here in about two weeks. 
Uh, my mom and dad will sign bottles. Uh, nice. Grandkids will be riding bikes, wrestling, fighting each other on the concrete floor. Someone will probably go to the hospital. And uh, the rest of us, <laughs> wives and brothers, will be working their butts off, hammering and boxing and palletizing bourbon as fast as we possibly can. And we sign every single bottle. You guys can turn all those bottles around you have. They're mm-hmm. signed by, I'll tell you who they're signed by. Um, that's what we do. And I, I we don't want to change that. You know, I mean, that's what's important to us. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, oh, you mentioned. Like- you mentioned right. history, you know, just being a history buff early on. And this is something that has captured me here lately is kind of digging into craft distilling and whatnot. And to me, what you're doing takes it back to the very origins of distilling in this country period, even colonial times. Yeah. It was the farm distiller. Absolutely. You know, that if you boil it down to its to its mm-hmm. original product, if you will, it's the farm distiller. You know, we can talk about craft distilling, grain to glass or sourcing from local farms. You guys are doing it from your own farm, the farm distiller. And that's, that's really the, the very foundation from where all of this took off. I love it. And I I couldn't agree more. Uh, You know, Alan Bishop got to go out and work on George Washington's on the George Washington uh, distillery project. And man, we, we, him and I talked about this, like, I, God, I wish I would have not been buried. I would have loved to go out there because uh, George Washington's wife, uh, I'll I'll leave you with this history. um, And this is kind of a a future project that we have. It's a couple years off, but it is already being produced and and laid down. But we, um, so uh, George Washington's wife was um, like uh, six great aunts on the rice side, on my rice side. So on my mom's side, um, super cool connection back there. And George Washington's um, flag bearer during the entire Revolutionary War was uh, my five great grandpa's George Fruits. And I have to tell you the story of George Fruits. So we have, um, he wow. is in the Guinness World Book of Records for the longest surviving veteran of the Revolutionary War. Uh, he lived to be 109. He had 13 Eight. kids and only four of them had offspring. Um, I am one offshoot of that off uh, spring. And he um, he settled in Alamo, Indiana, and uh, he refused to carry a weapon during the Revolutionary War, but he carried the flag. And um, he was six foot seven. He was a <laughs> fucking gorilla. Okay? And, uh, he, uh, he fought in every single uh, major engagement and never was wounded once. I'm and, just saying that's uh, all day to be the flag yeah. bearer at six they, foot seven. Oh, six you're, seven, you're a target. You, yeah, it, no, exactly. This, this if you understand thing, warfare. So, exactly. So they, uh, the, the crazy thing of this story is, and, you know, they talk about uh, how this country was started in divine, you know, divine intervention and, and manifest destiny. And I, you know, I can't, uh, you know, I don't know. I'm just going to say it. I'll, I'll put it out there. I'm, I'm pretty damn proud to be an American. And I think some people are afraid to say that anymore. You know what I mean? And mm-hmm. our history is incredible. And he, uh, you know, the average red coat at that time was about five, four, five, five. And, you know, imagine this gorilla of a man carrying them. And so there's a, uh, I forget exactly which battle it is, but uh, I believe it's the same battle where George Washington had something like six musket uh, balls through his cape. Uh, George got the flag shot out of his hands three times. He was carrying it at the base of the flag because they were because everybody's trying to shoot the flag, right? You know, it was a morale thing. Exactly. And, uh, he, um, I mean, he's the biggest target, literally at this time, the biggest target on the field. And he never, never had thirteen kids. Moved to Alamo, Indiana. That was his uh, basically payment for being like a Revolutionary War hero. So we have a. Um, and I'll be honest, this is probably the campiest product we, we have, but I have a red, white, and blue grained, and I, I, I'm, I'm going to make it a bourbon because it's got to be a bourbon, man. We got we to do that. So, uh, and that is, uh, that, is, that is being aged in um, uh, going to be our uh, flag bearer bourbon that we do for Grandpa George and pretty cool. So, yeah. That's awesome. awesome. That's so awesome. just look up, look awesome. up Google flag bearer George, uh, George Fruits and you will see his headstone and it's just insane, man. Lots of, lots of family history there. And I, I think, uh, you know, it's just, it's to your exact point, man, uh, you know, farm distillers, it is, it is where we came from. And, and, and I don't think yeah. we all need to be that. Does that make sense? Like, I don't, yeah. you ask earlier about, you know, these, uh, uh, you know, producer and uh, grain producing distilleries and all this. And, you know, the big guys, there is, there is a hunger for the product 
and I can't meet that. Does that make sense? I mean, I, yep. you, you know, I always say we can, we individually are an enormous craft distiller. I'm not even close to up to pr- what I can produce, but most of the big companies own nine of me. You know what I mean? Like I can't yeah. compete with that. So um, to that, I say we're going to know our niche and make the best stuff we possibly can. And I love our transparency. Does that make sense? That's why I always yep. tell yeah. my customers is, you know, you know that this, when you take a sip of the three bottles that you guys are in individually, those came from one family, one farm, one distillery, one distiller, you know, to that individual bottle. And that's what, <laughs> that's what I like to show off. So. Mm-hmm. Awesome. <laughs> so my mic just. I don't even know. Uh, <laughs> but that's okay. I was some of that, and that's all right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but Jason, like we said, we, we want to thank you for coming on the show. Uh, like we said, if if you ever want to come back on again, I know we probably just Mike oh, yeah. and Ben and I in the private chat. We we had probably 15, 20 other questions to ask you, yeah. but we don't want to hold you here for three hours. We don't think that's fair to the wife and family tonight. No. Yeah. <laughs> yep. But like we said, we can't thank you enough for coming on. It was a ton of great information. And if you get a chance, stop really? at Old 55 because it's it's a heck of a place, and you're going to get to taste some fantastic whiskey when you're there. So Very good whiskey. Yeah. yeah guys, very, thank you so yes. much. I really appreciate it. <laughs> no, no. Um, so remember, it's not the size of the den that matters. It's the whiskey. Cheers, everyone. Let's get into it. One, two, three.